Quick, this is crazy topic. Hey, what's going on? What's going on? What's going on? What's up? What's up? Welcome, 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 everybody. Hey, what's going on, everybody? Welcome to Counter Boys. Yeah, I'm about to get it in today. Definitely, definitely. Uh, yes, yes, sir. Hope everybody doing good. Hope everybody excited. We got a great topic for everyone today. Um, so super excited, super excited to get this going started. Um very timely with everything that's going on today. First off, my name is Everett Stevenson. Um, and I want to welcome you guys to Counterpoise along with my co-host to the right of me, which is I'm Samantha Adams. Sam, nice to see you all. Yeah, I'm Sam Adams, aka Samantha Adams, aka a whole lot of other nicknames, but here I am. Thank you and welcome. <laughs> hey, it's Willie Foster. How are everybody doing today? All right, all right. Yeah, I really appreciate that. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. Uh, definitely. So, hey. all right, guys. We got a good topic today for everybody, right? What I wanted us to go through, and we you know we were talking about this a little bit earlier in the week, was like, yo, um, everybody's been having a lot of talk about, you know, the vaccine, COVID-19. We've seen a lot of people were getting ready to start taking the vaccines and stuff like that. Um, and so I thought it would be good for us to just sit down and really chop it up and, and, and talk about some things about, you know, what, what the vaccine is, maybe to look into some 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 research in, into uh, how this one came about um, and, you know, discussions as to how it's played with medicine within, you know, the black community and what our personal opinions are as to what we think about, you know, the vaccine and, and COVID-19 situation that's coming out. So. Um, one of the things that we have um, today for us to review is a video from um, a microbiologist out in Texas uh, on Instagram. Her name is The Woke Scientist. Um, she has a, um, a Instagram TV post that she did, uh, which was well over an hour long, and she broke down the history between some um, of medicine in general. Um, and how it is monetized in this country, along with um, the history between medicine and how it's been used internationally uh, within black and brown communities and vaccines in particular, and how um, um, vaccines have been introduced and, and used um, like with people of black and brown communities. So um, in a minute, we're going to go ahead and get this video started off real fast. I um, want to thank everybody for coming in and checking in. Definitely appreciate the support. And yeah, how y'all feeling, everybody? Good, I'm ready. I'm ready. I feel good. Okay. I'm doing good. Y'all y'all had a good holiday, right? Yeah, my holiday was great. Yeah, you know, you were here just passed around. Mm hmm Well, happy new year, y'all. I, I do too much, man. Just really relaxed. Man, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I'm definitely trying to figure yeah. out like who who had a real good New Year, who was lit with the New Year, like what was really going on out here, like you know. So yeah. <laughs> I was ready for bed at ten thirty. I I brought it in with my family on Zoom, but I was tired. Yeah, I'm ready to rock. I, I, I was, yeah, same here. Yeah, I'm ready for the video. Y'all ready? Let's jump in. Yeah, let's go. You yes, sure? So, yeah, um, so there's a lot of people of color behind this. And I think it's important to talk about who comes up with the vaccine. So number one, the Pfizer vaccine, which is the Pfizer, um, the most recent one that we're talking about, has been given emergency approval. So we'll go through like quickly what the approval process is. But I mean, long story short, what that is emergency use authorization is something that's given by the FDA in like extreme, extreme situations where, um, yeah, are you all getting lags? I have no idea, you guys. It's like storm. Okay, so can y'all hear me? <laughs> this is really sad. Yeah, there is a storm. Um, so, 
Um, Andy, can you just let me know if you can hear me? I'm probably gonna switch my Wi-Fi off. Oh, thank you. Switch my Wi-Fi off, and that's, that should be better. Um, so the process of uh, making a vaccine normally takes about 10 to 15 years, I would say. And again, um, the, the reason is, is because the whole process is we're not just working on like a vaccine, right? Like that's not our entire life. Um, Ellie, is it better now? I've turned off the Wi-Fi. <laughs> I love I, I love this. Okay, Ellie, is it better now? I turned off. Oh hell yeah! yeah I thank forgot you. sort of yours. We definitely so, have like she had a lot of Wi-Fi issues here, so it's please bear with these videos as it's going to be kind of choppy sometimes. And I think that's what people don't realize that the stringent process of, of getting this approval isn't necessarily skipped, but it's accelerated. And it's accelerated because uh, people literally just drop everything that they're doing and work extremely long hours and constantly and all day and seven days a week. And that's how we get things done. And for context, that's how we got COVID-19 testing to be done in-house. And what that means is like we didn't have to send it out anywhere to the CDC, right? So that's what like I was doing early on in the pandemic. So when this hit, starting January is when <laughs> there was like full-blown production put and, and, and effort putting on research and development um, for both COVID-19 diagnostics, for drugs, for, for everything. And the way the scientific world works is everyone just has a niche, right? Like everyone splits themselves apart and really focus on, on doing this, which also means like we drop everything. So I I do research on antibiotic resistance. Like that's what my research is. And I'm a clinical microbiologist. So I have like, you know, in general, I specialize in diagnosing infectious diseases. But when the pandemic hit, everything stopped. And I put my entire effort, and this was again, seven days a week, all day, like 15, 16 hours a day of trying to optimize and develop a COVID-19 test, a rapid test that we, we could give answers to patients that have especially severe, severe, severe COVID in about an hour and a half. And I mean, we made that happen, but the, the level of, of dedication and time and teamwork and, and just you know zeal that goes into that is what makes that happen. And that is not a normal way that anyone can function. So that's a do or die scenario. Like that's how people have been working you know, that's how that's how people have been working every day for now 11 months, right? And then we have an emergency use authorization for a vaccine. So you have to think about just like the sheer force of like human will and labor and what we're doing this for is our communities. So that's why we have a vaccine that's, you know, coming out in this time frame as opposed to what the average time frame is. Not because it's skipped stringent, you know, processes. Also money. I think it's really important to talk about money. The money is where pharmaceutical industries come in because, again, the way that medicine is structured is hierarchical, right? People on the ground actually develop the vaccine. I think that's really important to understand that these aren't like, you know, capitalists sitting up on top of the pyramid trying to come up and figure out how this works, right? No, these are like working class scientists, infectious diseases scientists, virologists that work in the lab, like everyday people like me that I know um, are developing this. And they're the ones pushing and driving the vision behind this. So they're the ones looking at the other side. They're do Okay, that was good. So with that video, yeah. it's a little handful. Um, I know one of the things that I took from that, and I'll, I'll start off first, and you guys just jump in, you know, you know how we do. Um, so one of the things I kind of took from that was like how she talked about, you know, the accelerated processing with this this pandemic of, uh, you know, um, with the COVID, and how you know people were kind of working overnight and you know long hours and all of that just to get you know the rapid testing available for the public and for individuals like you said with severe COVID. And to me, like, I think that, wow, that's great that we were able to find, you know, a mechanism for us to be able to detect it, you know, really, really fast um, and to grant us options. I also kind of wondered if that all left room for there to be um, issues with 
maybe uh, the detection of the actual virus within it. Not saying that it would be errors, you know what I'm saying, caused, but if there were to show that there was anything that may have been like mis misreports or misfilings, or I don't know the exact term that I'm looking for, but uh, um, but but that could also affect that. And so I think she may have spoke to about it a little bit more in in the video. Um, but I know that's one thing. Just watching that clip that would be is a question that I wanted to see um, responded to. And another thing I heard her say though that I thought was interesting was is that they started working on research for this in like around January, I believe. And I was kind of shocking to me because I remember like we were able to still do a lot of things without you know any kind of precautions to. Um, you know, hey, wear a mask. You know what I'm saying? How there was not that conversation in January of 2020 coming in. You know, um, there were still big gatherings and still things going on, um, in order for you know the world to continue to you know run at, at run at function until you know what I'm saying. I believe like around maybe March or April. You know what I'm saying? It started to be like, okay, we're gonna start shutting things down. Blah, blah blah you know we're gonna really like you know you need to wear a mask to be outside and all of that so i think that's kind of interesting too is if you guys were already kind of doing research in this why not prep the the public to try to take preventative measures so that we could kind of maybe try to hopefully slow down the pandemic from hitting at such a large scale i guess that it came in when um the public was starting to be aware of it so my understanding, based on what she said, was, um, yeah, they started in January, and yeah, the country didn't, our country didn't shut down until March. All the, all the other countries had been shut down, and so, um, you know, the, the United States was such a um, play such a big role in everything as a country, and uh, so I'm not wholeheartedly surprised that we started in January because they looked other countries and stuff looked to us for almost everything, especially too at the rate in which COVID was spreading. I think that they knew that it was gonna come here. It was just a matter of and how long it was gonna take and how, how it was gonna hit and affect us. I don't think that we were prepared for it to happen the way that it did, but the scientists seem to have been. I think um, one of the things that I, um, I didn't get a chance to hear her talk about was about, because she mentioned the fact that they stopped everything to do the rapid testing, I mean, to, just, to, to, to create the rapid testing, but what I didn't hear her talk about was the error rate. And that the error rate is concerning, right? Because there's so many false positives and false negatives. Like I know several people that got sick and they believe that they had COVID even though they tested negative because they had all the other symptoms. You know what I'm saying? So, I mean, it's tough because, you know, there's a lot, it's so layered when you start talking about the vaccines. Another thing is that, you know, it's good that the FDA has that, has that all hands on deck and emergency situations protocol. Um, but, mm -hmm. When you look at the one of the biggest issues I think that you know a lot of people in the community have are that's fast. You know what I'm saying? Like AIDS was a epidemic and there is no cure, well, allegedly no cure for that. You know what I'm saying? People die of ca uh, cancer, heart disease. How about the common cold? That thing's been around for the for freaking forever, and there's no you know, vaccine for that. So, you know, I mean, it's, it's, it's the skepticism with the vaccine, I think, um, not just coming from cultural things, but just looking at just those, those, those things in a box. Like, an, I don't know if it's a vacuum, but when you look at all these other illnesses that are out there, you know, I don't know, it's, it's tough. I don't know. What do you think, Malik? Well, um, I think that, um, you know, regardless of what she was saying, I think it was rushed. You know, she's 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 pretty much explained that, oh, there is more money. There is more people working on it and they're working seven days a week. Like they no sleep, no rest, basically. Rest. 
to develop this vaccine in an 11 month time frame, right? So um, I do agree with you guys that it is a big rush and um, and that, you know, our community should be um, a little weary of it because, you know, due to the history of what's been going on with them, that you mentioned that, you know, they test them on, you know, people of color, black, brown folks all the time, and that's how they generate the money. So, you know, that's another thing for concern. Like, they're using us as guinea pigs, you know, black people all across the world. So, that's not a good look. Don't like it. And she's pretty much admitting, like, hey, that's what they do. This, you know, these other big companies, they have the money. And, you know, it's nothing really we can do about it until the, the system and the industry changes. So, you know, it just goes to show that racism is in all areas and all activities, no matter what it is. Even though there may be good people working behind a vaccine, they're like, oh, the people in charge are going to say, oh, we're going to have it tested on black people. So even though there may not be any malice behind the people who develop the vaccine, there's malice behind the people who control the money. So that's the issue. So that's all I have to say about that video. I'm going to queue up the next video, unless you guys have any other follow-up comments on that. No, I'm just going to queue it up, and then we can just bring it all together at the end. All right, this next video is like nine minutes long. Let me get it up. Okay, let's roll it. A little bit longer. If we get to share that screen, yeah. then we're like. Sorry, yeah. I had to pull it. Let me know there if y'all got to see it. Yeah, we can All see right. it. Mm hmm. How about the lag? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so the way that the page scale works is you have infectious diseases, <laughs> and infectious diseases are one of the lowest paid specialties. And I say that because that's how internal medicine, family medicine, so the people, the doctors that are taking care of like your everyday needs, your primary care physicians, the people that are kind of like what we talk about, your know, front line, and those, like, those people are very underpaid and overworked. And I don't think people realize how bad that situation is. That in, and most of the time that they're training, like in the process of my training, we get paid like barely the poverty line, right? And then even when you become an attending, right? So when you become like, like climb the ladder or whatever, it's still literally crumbs compared to what certain other specialty makes, right? Or um, just anything. Good God. Okay, hopefully it's still back. Um, and that's really important uh, because the whole myth of, um, is it cool now? Oh my God, I, I love how the chat is mostly just about like my lag. I'm sorry, y'all. This is like, I have like zero control over this. Um, thank you. So that's why it just doesn't add up when we're talking about profit margins here, right? Because the people that are developing this on the ground are, are poor. <laughs> and people that are making sure the clinical trials are going smoothly are poor. And then people that are making sure that there's some sort of like oversight and regulations are poor. And so at what point, right, are we getting, a, like at what point is the conspiracy happening? That's what I think people really, really, really need to understand that this whole like big pharma is, is, you know, one, yes, big pharma is a capitalist, like just <laughs> um, the most unethical, you know, unethical, it, just the idea of what big pharma is, is, is that it's existing within a system of healthcare that prioritizes profits over people, right? Prioritizes, honestly, if you think about it, there's more profit in people being sick than people being healthy because when you're healthy, you don't need medication and there's no profit. So the model, the model of pharma absolutely is a exploitative capitalist, you know, extremely, extremely problematic model. But what's important to remember is how infectious diseases come into the picture. And Inf infectious diseases are nothing, nothing, nothing like where majority of pharmaceutical industries are focused on. And where they're focused on is chronic illnesses. So these are things like cardiovascular disease, diabetes, hypertension. Um, those are drugs 
that are dependent on for the rest of their lives. And that's where the biggest money and profit margins really are. If um, anyone, and anyone in the healthcare field knows this, but as an infectious disease scientist, we struggle to get funding. Like we get pennies. We get we struggle to get money to make new antibiotics. We struggle to get money to, to like research vaccines. And the why is really important because one, vaccines and antibiotics, right? So if you think of or antivirals, antibiotics are specifically for um, for against bacteria, but antivirals are um, are specific for viruses. Antifungals are specific for fungi, etc. Um, so um, yeah, no, there isn't any evidence to show that. <laughs> so, um, yeah, no, I, I mean, like anyone, any capitalist can invest in anything, right? I don't think that has anything to do with like the reliability of vaccine or evidence or anything. The evidence is already there. There's tons of evidence to show. Um, yeah, it's going to be on IGTV after. Um, yeah, I don't really, I, everyone invests in stocks and I don't think that's indicative anything really <laughs> um because the evidence is there the evidence is totally decoupled and dependent of like investors and again that's why it's important to remember like the material conditions of people on the ground right there's it's important to um think about who's doing this like who's doing the work who is it benefiting because infectious diseases impact black and brown communities the most right the most marginalized the poorest the most vulnerable at-risk communities the most and what's really important to remember, and I wish there was like, I actually pulled up like the slides that I teach with, so y'all can see this. Um, so when we think about the most uh, prevalent causes of death in the world, there is a stark shift between what kills people in colonial countries, right, or settler colonial countries like the United States, Europe, et cetera, et cetera, and then with what kills people in post-colonized black and brown countries. And that's really where I think all of this is at. And I'll actually show you, I think you'll be able to see the slides. Um, so if you're, um, ugh, I hate this. Okay, let's tone that down. So basically, um, ugh, sorry, there we go. Um, so this like here is just a breakdown of like the most prevalent causes of death in the 1900s. And you won't, you don't need to see it like super clearly, but basically these are infectious diseases. Like they were the biggest cause of death. And then there's like cancer, heart disease, cardiovascular, um, accidents, et cetera, right? So this is the 1900s. And then you move to 2010. So what we're looking at here is the green. So this was infectious diseases. That's gone down to this, like that's the sliver here, right? And what comes up is cancer, heart disease, et cetera. And that's the, and the why is, is is pretty obvious, but I think it's important to actually see how much of a drop this has been, um, because it has been quite a bit of a drop. It's um, it's essentially a significant, huge decrease. Like that's the level of decrease that we're seeing um, in the impact that infectious diseases has had from the 1900s till now, right? Um, and the why is is here. So this is just a timeline of like how many people, um, and this is the United States specifically, have been dying in the United States from infectious diseases over time, right? So this is about uh, over a century. And this is a lot, a lot, and these are crude death rates, so it's per 100,000 people. Um, great. Um, and this is about vaccines, <laughs> there's a title. Um, so on top, this is like a ton of people are dying, right? And then less people, less people. Um, this was the influenza pandemic. So you can see, you know, pandemics are, are huge, right? Huge then, huge now. And they are outliers in how many people are dying. And something happens like right around here, <laughs> right? Which is that first thing that really changed everything is sanitation. Hygiene and sanitation is kind of like what started coming up around here and then antibiotics and then vaccines and then just like taper off, right? So that is of like what we're living in now, which is that we're living in an area that's very much what people used to call, I think, post-infectious diseases, but what we're coming back up into is an era where infectious diseases are gonna be coming back again. And for multiple reasons, 
one capitalism because capitalism itself is a system that is so exploitative that it literally is using everything from this planet and that it's like a butterfly effect right like when you change an ecosystem and throw off the balance there's going to be a butterfly effect that kind of just just starts um changing the way that the environment and the ecology works and that's microbes are a part of that so what that means is viruses mutate faster and viruses mutate faster because they're stressed they're just like us right the more stress we have the more we feel like we need to adapt and viruses mutating faster essentially means that there's going to be more pandemics. And I have a post, um, if you're interested in the connection between the environmental crisis and why indigenous methods of preserva preservation are probably going to be the only thing um, that allows us to you know, slow down the frequency of pandemics is because, again, of, of the connection that indigenous communities have with their land and their water and resources, and the importance of ma maintaining uh, ecology in an ecosystem, right? Um, and there's a post um, that I that I specifically how not you know tackling the environmental crisis and the climate crisis has led to this particular moment to COVID happening. And there's a graph that I think is really striking from um, the CDC and and I NIH. That shows that in the 1980s, the only emerging infectious diseases was HIV AIDS. And so specifically HIV being the, the virus. And then you fast forward to right now, there's like 300 more, um, 300 and more um, infectious diseases that are emerging. And that's not something that actually just happens, right? There has to be certain conditions and material realities that change to make that happen. Um, so now, Hmm. That's interesting. All right, that was a. Whew. Yeah, anybody want to take first on this one? I'll go. All right. Uh, I'll start from the <laughs> end. Of it. I'll start from the end of what she said about how there's all these emerging infectious diseases that nobody has any idea about. Um, but she talked about what right. they're doing about them. You know right. what I mean? <laughs> like. Um, because what we don't need. Yeah, is, yeah. Clip kind of cut. Right. Yeah, cut kind of short. So, like, what are they doing about these three hundred emerging infectious diseases? Where did they come from? Like, she mentions conditions, but what kinds of conditions are you talking about? Like global warming type conditions? Are you talking about different man-made type uh, uh, chemical warfare type conditions? Like. What are the conditions that she's talking about, um, and what are they doing about them? And then um, are they are they trying to develop things that are preventative for those things? And it doesn't seem as rushed as the COVID. I mean, the COVID vaccine. You know what I'm saying? Because I mean, I get why the COVID vaccine has been rushed, especially well, in yeah, America. Let me back on a little bit of that. Go ahead. Oh yeah, no, I hear you. And before you get into the vaccine, you know, the timeline. I wanted to say, like, because two things, like, right, like, because I think in the, in the video, she kind of explained, like, how, you know, that they're just the scientists, they work on, you know, what she was working on or whatever, right? But, like, I don't think they have control over, like, say, the companies who may, you know, do, like, the, the whole buying tax or, or, you know, EPA credits so that they can, you know, dish as much oil or, you know, whatever off into the world and, and cause these type of harms, right? Like, so I think, those are some of the factors because like she said it's like global warming things of that nature climate control type of issues that's that's causing some of these these um these diseases that are now being more prevalent um or upcoming diseases that may come in, a, in the near future right so it's like you know we might need to try to control that and unfortunately how does that go right if we keep getting more and more people we're going to have to have more and more stuff you know what i'm saying things are going to have to be used and they're going to try to find more efficient means to doing it and if it means more gas infusion infusion things of that nature um or if it means that you know uh more uh less like you said trash getting built up and things of that nature where we don't even have the ability to recycle as, as well as we should be doing like that's those are the type of things that i kind of concern myself with because i feel like that's the type of stuff that even though scientists can't do that that's what we need our government to do and uh, and hold other other um, entities that should be holding, um, or excuse me, other uh, systems that should be holding other entities in place so that, you know what I'm saying, we can slow down these effects. 
But I'm sorry, I know you yeah, but I think that, the timing. No, you're fine. But I think I think the issue with that has a lot to do with politics and capitalism, right? Because when you're talking about capitalism and money and the way that our country moves, our country, our country functions in money. And when you start talking about big pharma, the people that are responsible for distributing these 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 um these medications, and I'm not even just say vaccines, just medications in general and the capitalism and the money that's involved in it, especially too side when you start talking about politics in this country and you look at how Democrats and Republicans are in this continuous fight about um, about the health of our planet and and doing things to help uh, mitigate global warming and how they fight over it all because what money it all boils down to money you know what I'm saying and even in, in this clip she talked about how um, infectious disease people don't get the money that they need and it's like that's not good. <laughs> like, you know what I'm saying? If they, I'm pretty sure if they had the money that they needed, I'm not going to say we wouldn't be in this situation that we're in now because COVID spread so quickly, but we wouldn't, it wouldn't be like this. You know what I'm saying? It wouldn't be, we wouldn't be at a point where, you know, oh, now all of a sudden let's throw money at a situation that should have had funding in the beginning. So now everybody's rushing. Like, yeah, they started in January, but who's to say they wouldn't have started in November, you know, when, when, when COVID started out there in China, you see what I'm saying? Like, and, and that's just, and mind you, she's just talking about the rapid testing at that point. She's not even talking, she wasn't even talking about the vaccine in January. She was talking about testing. You know what I'm saying? So I don't know, it gets, it gets tough. Um, the one thing that I found interesting, though, that she had mentioned that I wanted to make sure I touched on is how she talked about how general med medical doctors are poor, right? I thought that was interesting. And I'm, I kind of felt like maybe I'm misinterpreting what she's saying, but my take on what she was saying was like, yeah, there's a hierarchy, yeah. you know, big from is a child and medical doctors are at the bottom and they don't, they get paid pennies in comparison to the big pharma people, right? And it shouldn't be like that. And I, I low-key agree, but at the same time, like, I think calling them poor is, um, to be careful with that because that is a stretch considering the money. fact that a lot of people don't make money like doctors make. Yeah, yeah exactly. I don't know so why. It's like that. I, I totally disagree with that point. That was the first thing I noted down here. I wrote, wrote like the pay scales low. She, she, she used the wrong words because they make more than the average person, especially if they're in a private practice. Right. So if you're working for the government or something, right. of course you probably that pay, but it's still above average, I'm sure. No one's going to pay a doctor working on infectious disease specialists less than 100000 a year. So I don't know where she's exactly. getting like, the board from. But I think what she meant by uh, uh, Guys, hold on. Let me push back a little bit, too. Her, let, me, let me push back her, on that one real quick, though, Lee. Be, hold on. Let me, let me say this real fast. Because I think what she was saying, too, was, you know, Big Pharma gets the money that they get, right? Like, you're going to get billions, right? You know what I'm saying? And then the doctors, in, in comparison to what they make, you know what I'm saying? That's who's getting the, the big flow of, of the money, right? The well, real wealth. And then the doctors get some of that, right? Now, from our standpoint and why we talk about these show is because we're talking about it not just necessarily from a professional, but we're talking about it from also the working class and from the, you know what I'm saying, the, the emerging communities that we know, right? So I feel like, for us to look at it from that standpoint, it's like, yeah, like, okay, yeah, maybe, you know, Big Pharma makes a lot. Then after that, you know, medical doctors get a portion of that. But I think what she was saying is doctors that's working on infectious diseases are not getting paid like a doctor that might work at a hospital or, you know what I'm saying, in a private practice. The doctors that's trying to find these infectious diseases are getting a lot less because at the same time, you aren't progressing, like you're not keeping them in business. You're trying to solve an issue as opposed to, you know what I'm saying, just handling the issue and, and, and kind of like monitor, what is it called? Like when you're just ma managing the issue as opposed to solving the issue, right? Yeah, so it's like there's no money in, 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 in trying to fix the problem. The money is, you know what I'm saying, and managing the problem. So I think that's why she was like, oh, well, we don't get the funding a lot of time because they're like, why the fuck we want to help y'all? You know what I mean? Like, 
y'all gonna put us out of business. Like, what sense does it make? It makes more sense for us to not have a cure for AIDS, to not have a cure for cancer, and to keep giving you this treatment mm-hmm. and to keep having you come in and playing part of the system. And so I think, and when she was saying they get it that low because it's like you kind of are fighting that battle. You know what I'm saying? Because this is what's keeping us in, 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 in this is what's keeping us in focus and, and in business. And what you're doing, low key, is kind of trying to take us out of business by solving answers and solving it completely, right? Where you don't have to, you know what I'm saying, keep coming back for, you know, your new prescription each month to not yeah, go. That, that's, but that's greed, though. Like, you know, when you really look at it, there's so many illnesses that they could fix, right? They could completely find the cure for and fix based on what what I gather from what she's saying. And even what you're saying, they can fix a lot of things. But there's also a whole nother level of things that they cannot fix because they're chronic. You know what I'm saying? And Big Pharma still stands to gain a lot just from those chronic illnesses. But that greed makes them want to limit their the infectious disease folks ability in order to fix a lot of these problems just so they can continue to make more money like people's like we learned in law school Agreed. you know when you start talking about pain and suffering it's hard to put a number on how much somebody has suffered you know what i'm saying how how do you quantify in a dollar amount mm-hmm. pain especially when it's some kind of pain that somebody might have to live with for the rest of their life if they were in some sort of a catastrophic event. You know, you come up with a number, you know what I mean? There's different ways that you, you know, use math and you come up with a number to try to figure that out. Also, too, depending on what is the grand scheme of what happened, who is your who is your defendant, who are you suing, do they have money? Like, you know, you have all of those different factors, and I get it. But at the same time, when you're talking about somebody's health and you're talking about somebody's livelihood, I think that people have to remember. I think that I get the fact that entities are not people, but we are. And without human beings, they wouldn't exist. And so, you know, to put dollars before people sometimes can create, I mean, it does, it creates issues. It definitely creates issues. And I think that, you know, we have to be better about that. You know, um, and it, and like Malik said, she used the wrong word because poor ain't it. Like they they might not make as much money, but poor, poor is that's a that's a big word. You know what I'm saying? Is to yeah. claim indigenous. I'm like, okay, when you're starting and you're still training, and after those years of you finishing up your apprenticeship or whatever the process is for an infectious diseases specialist. But then you get above, like, you know, maybe the 35000 or whatever they start you off at, and then you get the regular salary. But, I mean, that that's that's part of the course of being a doctor in the industry, right? So that part is understandable. When but, you yeah, and I think that's so. but also with the pharmaceutical, pharmaceutical but I, industry, it's, uh, what are you going to say, you were gonna say something? Oh no, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was just gonna say I think that's twofold though. Yeah, real quick. Um, I didn't mean to interrupt you, but I was just gonna say like I, I didn't mean to interrupt you, part of here. <laughs> but what I meant yeah, to say yeah. that was uh like I think I think that when 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 you make that statement of saying like okay, you know, hey, you know, that's part of your process, or you know what I'm saying, you guys are getting money again. I think we're comparing this all to the fact of the relative average American, right? But in the grand scheme of things, it still ain't no money. When we look at how much big pharma might bring in for the year, and I know that's another conversation for another topic, right? Well, how much well, pharmacy uh, makes how much big pharma, it. like it's Pfizer and, funding. you know. Go ahead. And what do you mean by that? Oh, what I mean by that is. No, I'm asking what do you mean by like looking at it from a governmental funding? Yeah, I think that's how she's looking at it from like the funding, not, not from her individual salary, even though she meant she said that, but also from the that the funding, right? Because these infectious disease specialists need the funding, right? Billions of dollars to allocate to do this research, to pay the employees over time, to gather the materials, purchase all that stuff. So that's where the governmental funding and government subsidies come into play. 
And a lot of that is put into the pharmaceutical industry and little is put it into Sound real socialist. Into the medicines <laughs> and stuff like that. But I mean, you know, it's the truth, right? They put a lot of money into big pharma, as everybody says. So, you know, there there's more money in the treatments as opposed to the cures. So, you know, if you have a chronic illness, not life threatening, they're like, well, you can live with this, just take this pill. But with COVID, it's not like you can live with this, take this pill. People are dying and it's very um, infectious. So with the chronic conditions, it's not as infected. Infectious, you can't get like infected. It's just something you're born with or something with your cells or something like that. It's totally different on how you acquire acquire one of those chronic illnesses as opposed to the COVID. So, but to add, to add to think, this, what you just said, Malik, COVID is messing up the church's money. You know what I'm saying? So it's like when you look at COVID and you look at how <laughs> everything had to stop, right? People had to stop going to work, businesses stopped functioning, a bunch of businesses shut down, yeah. small businesses can't function, people aren't working, unemployment is at this all time high. Like you got all that, you're messing up the church's money. We're a capitalistic nation that runs on money. So now, of course, like I said, you got to throw money at the problem to fix it. You're not thinking about these issues when everything is rolling. You wait until something happens. It's almost like when it snows in Georgia, right? When it snows in Georgia, it might not be. Now, all three of us are from somewhere where it snows, like, right? But right now, Malik and I live out here in Georgia. Everett is out there in Florida. But we're all from northern states where we've seen real snow. I had to stand on the bus. Don't be telling my state. Hey, I didn't say where you was from. I just said you from a northern state. Relax. <laughs> but, um, you know, mm-hmm. we all know it's like to be in real snow. Girl, okay, that's more important. Yeah, for real. Oh, yeah. You, 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 you yeah. international yeah. 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 We ain't worried about you. That's international E. We ain't worried about him. By the time y'all find him, he'll be living somewhere else. So anyway. Um <laughs> so anyway, you know what I'm saying? In Georgia, Thank you. I don't see in Georgia, that. I, don't see that. Ago, I remember it snowed, right? I was in Florida at the time. I was in school. So it snowed. It wasn't a lot of snow, but it iced, and people were stuck on the highway, stuck at work, slept in restaurants, slept in their car. Kids got stuck at school. Why? Because the way Georgia was functioning, it's not like it never snowed in Georgia. But what ends up happening is what, ha- what happened was they wait till after it snows to plow. They don't treat the roads. The next thing you know, now everybody's stuck because it's ice and nobody can move. That's not how you do it. We don't know. I don't know if they say, oh, we about to get some snow. The sand and salt trucks go out. They treat the streets so that the streets so that when the snow falls and melts, then you get the people to come out and plow when it gets bad. That's how you do it. You have to function in a preventative from a preventative place. I get the fact that COVID happened and it happened fast and people weren't expecting it and all that. But the money has to be thrown at the prevention. It can't. I mean, big pharma can make plenty of money off of that too. Like, there's so many different ways they can make money, but it's the greed, it's the corporate greed, and putting money before the dollar before the people. You know what I'm saying? And, I think, and, and the saddest part about it is, black and brown folks are the ones that are affected the most. You know what I'm saying? Because a, we're treated as guinea pigs. Or B, Absolutely. you know what I'm saying? We are the ones that because you know education is not as great in our communities, we're the ones that go out and do exactly what you're not supposed to do. Case in point, look at COVID. That's how you put a mask on. First, you got people that don't want to wear a mask. Atlanta is out here moving like ain't no COVID. And then you see half the people with a mask on and their nose sticking out. Like, what's the point of that? Why you have a mask on? You see what I'm saying? So it's like, you know, we that's how we function and, and there's a better way to handle it. You know, that's just, you know, that's what I think. Yep. I, Did you guys I, I, have anything else to add to that? True, true. Hey, Malik, you got another one queued up for us? Yeah. I, I'm going to queue up the next video. It's about four minutes, so let's see what she has to say on this one. And again, her video, like everybody, like I said, check out her page on Instagram. It's the woke science. Like, 
right? Vaccines are, again, like, depending on how many doses you have, in the case of the Pfizer vaccine, it's currently standing at two doses that are taken about two weeks apart. And that's it. Like, there is no, there is no giant, you know, kicker about being dependent on this thing for the rest of your life. You're not going to have to have, you know, a down payment, re repetitive uh, payments to be able to get more access. It's, it's two doses. And that's what antibiotics are like, too, which is why, again, it's not even ideal for a capitalist system to be profiting off of antibiotics and vaccines. So if you really think about the claims that's that people just saying, Sam. about vaccines being this like big pharmaceutical, um, you know, scheme, that is really not where the money lies. Like, scientifically, that's not where the money lies, right? And if that was the case, I would be not living here. Um, actually, I'm really happy with where I am. I probably don't want to live in like a bare apartment. Um, but I mean, I would not be being paid what I do. Um, <clears throat> I wouldn't have to work for um, you know, seven days a week and the hours that I get that, that I have to work for to be able to like, you know, just really just be able to push the needle, right, in our field. And again, that's because we, we get scraps. Um, and no, it's a two-time thing, so it's a two-time thing. Um, both vaccines, the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine are two doses. And that's, again, because um, it's like a booster shot, right? Like, I'm sure y'all are familiar with like booster shots. Um, that was the, the idea behind it. And if there's any modification, it's going to happen. And that's something people need to realize that pandemics are like, it's a sh I'm sure it's a, like, y'all get it. It's a shit, right? And to, it's really easy to be on the sidelines and have a lot of critique and a lot of like things to say about the front lines and tear down the people that are in the fight itself. So it's extremely important to remember that like the people that are in the fight itself have like no time to even think about any of that, right? And they're focused on trying to do whatever they can to protect their communities. And that's because that's like, that's our entire like existence, right? That's why we do the work that we do that our driving force behind it. And if you, you have to think about it, like infectious diseases, scientists and physicians and clinicians and farm deans, if the money isn't in it, then why are they doing it? Because there is no monetary in incentive to do this. So the people that are actually making it, there is no like monetary incentive. And therefore, like, again, all of this, like back to, you know, people being like, people are like, we're paid, we're sellouts to what? Like for what, right? And why, if we were, and if that was like how much, you know, the, the physicians and scientists are making that are they're behind this, why aren't we better prepared for pandemic, right? Like, why are we still struggling to have like a decent healthcare system? Why are we not able to like, ourselves uplift ourselves, right? Why is majority of the internal medicine and family medicine, infectious diseases community, foreign medical graduates? So they are coming immigrants, right? And that's something, again, people don't realize that there's different specialties and these are the specialties where we have a lot of people, a lot of people working here in the United States and abroad, but a lot of people here in the United States are immigrants. Okay. So that one, I, I, uh, I got a couple of interesting points in that one. Like when she was talking about. Oh, go ahead. You go first. I'll go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. I said you can go first. So I'll go after you. Oh, um, no, I was just gonna say like what I heard were. Which... Okay, thanks. Um, what I heard her say was that there's no time for the frontline workers, right? Like they had to kind of you know take this this vaccine because they're you know in the fire, right? Essentially, like you know what I'm saying. You can't. What they say, like when you want to burn your house, you know what I'm saying? You can't be worried about, you know, whatever, grabbing the smallest things. You got to get out, you know what I'm saying, save yourself. Like not, you know, any small little books or something like that. You're not worried about that. You're worried about your safety, right? So I think for them, like you said, like, you know, being on the front liners, you know, you need something right now to slow down the bleeding because you are losing, you know what I'm saying, staff. You're losing, not only are we losing, you know, people in the population, but you also are losing frontliners as well. 
who may be getting um, infected, unfortunately. Um, and so, you know, that's important to keep in mind as we look at, you know, the people who are taking these vaccines, as we saw videos earlier this week um, with, you know, nurses and doctors and things of that nature who were receiving um, the vaccination and stuff like that um, earlier this year. I had a friend of mine, well, a good friend of mine, who was a doctor, and I seen him. He received it. I know a friend of mine who was a nurse. Uh, I saw them. They received it as well. So, like, um, just uh, seeing seeing a lot of people, especially in the health industry, uh, feel like you know, hey, you know, we're taking it. We have we have to do it. We're on the front line. I think it's like, okay, cool, good for y'all because you guys are like dealing with it you know, in mass, you know what I mean? As opposed to say a person who can maybe self-isolate and, and not necessarily, um, it's, especially an individual like myself, right? If you live in a metropolitan city, you it, like things have really been um, kind of convenient for us because you can make the ability to kind of curtail having to go out in public, right? Um, for some working from home, um, you know, being able to like order, you know, groceries and things of that nature, um, and again, if you know you have the means, right? Like, and being able to do some of these things, where you know Amazon, Amazon Prime, you can have whatever delivered to your front door. Um, now Amazon Fresh and stuff like that. Like, so you get all of these options that allow you to be able to um, kind of maneuver without having to go out and have much interaction with others. Um, we don't. I don't personally feel like I have to rush to get it, and you know, you can kind of give it a little bit more time to see. So that's one of the things that I'd like to talk about. And then also, she talked about how most of the people that's working on infectious diseases are immigrants. You know what I'm saying? Doctors and things of that nature. And I thought that was really um, big because I wonder how many people, you know what I'm saying, that our doctors are of immigrant descent. Period. You know what I'm saying? Because again, to reach, you know, that that level of professionalism. Um, is a lot of times challenging and to be able to have the means to get there, um, to be able to have the means to get there, you know, it can also be a hurdle if you don't have maybe a scholarship or something like that for you to, you know, make it or, you know, maybe the type of funding from you to, you know, even become a doctor or um, other whatever type of other professional degree that you might see, um, like a lawyer or whatever the case may be. Um, so yeah, that was those two things that I thought that were kind of interesting within that and that, within that context um, that she said. Really. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I thought um, what she was trying to convey to us to to her audience was that you know these infectious disease specialists and doctors working on vaccine aren't trying to you know build a vaccine to do some sort of conspiracy theory. And they have no incentive to do so because one, you know, it's not profitable. And two, the, one of the reasons why they get into the profession is to help their community to prevent things like this from happening or when things like this happen to have a response and be able to protect and save their community. So I think that was important for her to say that. Like, hey, we're not into the conspiracy theories. We're not, you know, taking orders from the people above. But uh, to push back on her, it's like the people above still run these tests and trial and error on black and brown people. So I think she hit on that point in another video, like, hey, they always do the trials on black and brown people. So if something bad happens, it's, it's the black and brown community that's going to suffer, not the, any other community, right? So I think she made that pretty clear. So I think that's what they do. They do. They do provide funding for these infectious these specialists and other scientists to actually uh, run these experiments on black and brown people. And so that's one thing that I noticed. And then the second point of immigrants. Yeah, that, that's another thing. There are a lot of immigrant doctors. I haven't done any research on that. Definitely not enough black doctors especially black American doctors, there may be some black African doctors or black doctors from other countries, but not enough black American doctors, definitely need more of those. So, um, you know, that, that you know, to another point of education, like black people definitely need to, you know, stress medicine um, in their communities so we can actually have some doctors. Um, that and people that we do trust uh, that we can go to when, you know, 
when we have a history of showing that we can't trust the government on certain things. Well, a lot of things really, especially when it comes to these infectious diseases and diseases in general and the medical and medical care industry. So that's just an interesting point. You got anything, Sam? Um, just the, the immigration thing I found to be, oh, there were two things. The immigration thing I found to be a little interesting because, yeah, like you guys said and like she said, you know, there are a lot of immigrant doctors and they don't talk, she doesn't really touch on that about um, Black American doctors. But, you know, when you start talking about any type of professional industry, whether it be doctors, lawyers, um, accountants, you don't have a lot of Black Americans. You know what I mean? I think that to touch on what you said, Malik, is, you know, that goes to education and encouragement. But as it pertains to this particular scenario, um, it, it it's a it's a catch-22, right? Because let's say you do have Black American doctors, like the Black woman, I can't remember her last name. Her name is Kizzy something. Sorry, I can't remember her name. But she was one of the uh, people in the forefront of coming up with the vaccine, right? And she's letting people know, hey, you know, this, it's okay to take it, yada, yada, yada. But then when you think back to the Tuskegee experiment, they put a black person out there too, like, hey, this is safe to take, da, 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 only to find out they was giving out syphilis, trying to tell them they were giving them like a flu shot. You see what I'm saying? So skepticism is there. And I get, I get what she's saying as far as talking about, um, you know, who is actually doing the work? Who is actually doing the legwork and in, in the front and working in the front lines, trying to make sure that the community is is protected from the from the virus? But it's it's hard for people to trust based on history, right? Because Tuskegee experiment is literally just one example. You know what I'm saying? It's been happening in countries all over the place where they continue to use this as test dummies and guinea pigs. Um, one thing, uh, to switch gears just a little bit that I wish that she had talked a little bit more about was when she talks about the two doses, two weeks apart, right? But she doesn't really get into the doses themselves. Like, what are the side effects? Because I don't care what medication you take, you put something in your body, there's going to be side effects. But maybe those side effects don't necessarily affect you, but there are side effects. And nobody's talking about the side effects. We see these random little videos like a nurse fainting. I mean, that was a little slightly out of context. Maybe she had like another, I think she she had some other condition going on or whatever. Or when people were getting Bell's palsy, which is uh, partial face, facial paralysis, you know, nobody's talking about like Dr. Fauci came on and he said that that people that were getting Bell palsy had some type of allergy. But an allergy to what? Like, you know. There's, there's too many people out here that are relying on it to not be clear and specific. You know what I'm saying? And then when you say two doses, two weeks apart, what happens if you don't get the second dose? And then oh, I've also heard, and I don't know how true it is, but I've heard that even after you get the vaccine, you still gotta you still gotta socially distance, wear a mask, and all that. So it's not like it's giving you the ability to create some level of normalcy. Um, in your life, you still have to function in this space of new normal. And I don't understand why, like nobody's really saying why, or now that there is a vaccine, once everybody gets it, how long is it going to take before we all get back to normal? Or are we never going to be normal? Or if we are going to go back to some semblance of normalcy, how far does that go? I just, you know, I just wish you had talked a little bit more about that. Yeah, um, and real quick, guys, I'm going to uh, share my screen because uh, I found some stuff that, uh, let's see why, me. okay, yeah, uh, I'm going to share my screen real quickly, and I found some, some imagery on um, doctors that are uh, based on, like, race, and I think this is from the uh, amac.org. Uh, which brought us a chart, pie chart up here, and it broke down on um, the percentage of active physicians in 2008 based off of race. Um, but this really didn't give me uh, too much of a good figure in regards to 
maybe nationality uh, of those races. Um, this is kind of just broken down into the normal, you know, black, African American, multi race, Hispanic, or white. Um, so then I also was able to find another article on a migration policy institute. And within this first paragraph, it had some interesting statements, which stated that in 2018, um, there were about 2.6 million immigrants um, and that they were employed um, as healthcare workers, with 1.5 of them being um, healthcare, or excuse me, doctors, registered nurses, and physicians. Um, even though, you know, like I said, immigrants represent only 17% of the overall U.S. workforce. Um, they are 28% of the physicians and 24% of dentists, uh, for an example. So it's close to almost a third of the doctors um, that we have. And, and like I said, in home health aid, you know, you're almost as at close to 40% here um, are of immigrant uh, excuse me, are of immigrant, uh, excuse me, of immigrant um, disease or background, descent, pardon me, or background. Um, so it is a, a, a pretty significant number. Um, I won't say necessarily significant, but a, a good number of percentage of individuals who work in the healthcare field um, do have a, or excuse me, um, a non-native background. Um, real quick, I just pulled up on my phone. I just pulled up on my phone while you were going over that. E, um, I looked up the average salary for an infectious di disease um, doctor, and that ranges. The twenty fifth percentile is one hundred thirty three thousand seven hundred seventy eight dollars. The top earners is two hundred forty three thousand six six dollars. So between one hundred thirty three thousand, one hundred thirty was rounded up to four thousand. So two hundred forty-three thousand dollars. The average person in this country doesn't make six figures. So I mean, I get what she's talking about as far as you know, getting paid pennies and all that, as it compares to big pharma. But when you're talking to the average person, six figures they think they're balling. You know what I'm saying? The average American doesn't make that much money, and so. Um, I mean, I get what she's saying, and I agree I with what she's saying. Most know about in terms of the the funding, I can agree with her on the funding aspect. But in terms of the salary, right. I'm like, there's no way a medical doctor is getting less than six figures once they finish their apprenticeship. But, but let's be honest, though, process. guys. Even even no six figures, like you. You might say, like, if you in the ones and twos, you in the low six figures to maybe some doctors who might be at, like, say, four or five. You know what I'm saying? And again, I think, I mean, of course, I think they're under where, eight, you, you know what I'm say saying? You are like, if you are an ER, a, a, P word out here. Yeah, I definitely don't say property. Yeah, I do that thing. That's a reach. That's a reach. That's a reach. Yeah, I was like, what is she talking about? That is a reach. Poor. Yeah, to say, oh, I, I agree. Know, we have poverty. You can't make too much money to be considered poor. You can't get any poor people benefits, right? Like, I don't yeah, know. I don't think they're exactly poor, but I think maybe the the clinic is poor in terms of it doesn't get the funding it needs to run itself. You know, things of that nature, like they don't always get adequate funding that they need or government subsidies. Right. And, and I agree with that. I definitely agree with that. They, they, that's what I was saying before about, you know, throwing money at a problem. If you if you put yourself in a space where the money is, is available to you, you know, prior to that running into the problem, then you're less inclined to run into the problem. You know what I'm saying? Agreed. But um, yeah, I'm not to pull on to that Ready for the next clip? Okay. All right. Clinical trials. So clinical trials is when we have something that we know is effective in a tube and then we're actually taking that and translating it to see if it's effective elsewhere right and again there's processes to that um before it even gets to people and oh, god damn oh uh, is it better at all oh 
Oh, is it better at all? Damn it. Am I just putting my Wi-Fi on again? Any is it better? Houston just had to uh, storm a second. Uh, no, not necessarily. That's not really how it was in terms of stock. Um, so no, <laughs> um, I'm again. I'm gonna you know contextualize this that I'm working with a group of uh, infectious diseases is a very multidisciplinary field. So we have scientists, right? We have basic scientists. That are you missing a lot of gems? <laughs> is, is this better? Yeah, now it's like hooked up to my Wi Fi, and I think the Wi Fi has turned back on. Ellie, let me know if it's better. Thank you. Um, so again, the process, the way that it works um, is we have a multidisciplinary team. So there's the scientists, right? Those are the PhDs. There's the pharmacists, that's the PharmDs. So they, they, again, doctors, but still specializing in the drug itself. And then there's physicians, right, which are MDs. And then there's ev everyone else in the medical team. So there's nurses and, and, and you know, specialists when it comes to like respiratory therapists. So there's, it, it's a very collaborative team, but they're all working class. Like, I don't think people realize how medicine works and, and how um, pay works, right? There's a hierarchy there itself. Again, the part the, the part about this being a col colonial system, is it? Oh my God, kill me now. Um, is it really lagging again? God damn. Um, how bad is the lag? Oh, okay, cool. Um, so, the way that the pay scale works is you have infectious diseases, <laughs> and infectious diseases are one of the lowest paid specialties. Well, she's having a lot of water. Can't really get too much out of that. Yeah, but I think I'm, I get where she was going with it, right? She's talking about the colonization of the medical field. You know what I'm saying? And I, um, I think she says it in the next clip. Um, I think the last clip we have, where she talks about anytime you talk about vaccinations or anything, it's for rich white people, right? And that's who they're made for. Um, but they use black folks as black and brown folks as guinea pigs, and not just black and brown folks, because I think she talks about it in the next clip. But um, you know, when you start talking about the colonization of any type of industry, that's when you run into the types of issues that we have now, right? Where you have um, uh, almost like a battle because not only is it colonialized, it's capitalized which is what I've been saying, like, you know, throwing money in front of, throwing money at the problem as opposed to throwing money at the prevention of the problem. Because it's never a problem until people with the money are affected by it, right? So then we run into that issue. And so how do you prevent that from have, having an effect on everybody else? Because the people with the money are 1%. And then meanwhile, the other 99% are suffering because the people with the money don't see an issue until, you know, it affects them. And, you know, you got to do better as a society. I mean, having money or not having money, we just have to do better as a society because, you know, these illnesses don't give a damn about how many pennies you got in your pocket. They just don't. I mean, yeah, could you have a better quality of life? Um, in some aspects when you have money, yes, especially when it pertains to your health because you have a higher quality of medical care. But two things that are two things are for sure. You know what I'm saying? Like you're gonna be born and you're gonna die. And it's about how you get there, <laughs> you know, and what it feels like for you. And for some things, for some people, there's not a penny in the world, there's not enough money in the world to prevent people from getting sick and suffering, whether it be from COVID or anything else. And 
you know, I think in the broad scheme of things, when you start talking about the colonialization of medicine, you know, we're all people, we're all human beings functioning on this planet, and we have to find a better way to be there to, to uplift each other as opposed to it being about money, you know, or or even, um, you know, how it's been colonized by, by saying that just because somebody has a better status or stat or better bank account, that they deserve something more than the next person. Um, agree. Um, anything? Um, I have comments about this quick, 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 quick excuse me. Some twister there. No, um, not this one. No, I'd rather check I the next like, one out. I like how you mentioned uh, the clinical trials. I wish you would have expanded a little bit more about the clinical trials point uh, instead of trying to convey that higher pay higher point. Because I think it's important for people to know, like, okay, the first once it gets to the clinical trials, that means the vaccine works in the tube, but now we have to create how it if, how it works in a different environment. So that's pretty much, you know the clinical trials thing like it works, but we have to see how it affects the human body or environment and see how that goes. Um, so I thought that was important that she mentioned. That was good. But, you know, the pay hierarchy point, I'm like, there's no way you're trying to convince people that uh, a medical doctor is just going through such a struggle with getting money. Like, it's hard to convince, you know, your followers, normal people, anybody, unless you want to show us your pay stubs, and show us your paychecks. There's no way because people will Google stuff and see well over a hundred thousand. I think it's two different industry. things, though. Not not funding to but, get paid, but, not funding to get paid, but funding to solve a problem. That's two different types of money, right? Money money correct. to solve the issue versus the money that I'm getting paid to do the work. So I think, like you said, like like what Sam was alluding to earlier, we're underfunded, we're That's under the and then we're only money. making this much. Like when she's saying pay huh? hi hierarchy, it's like when she's saying paid hierarchy, um, it's like she's talking about like okay, this is the kind of doctors that get paid more than these doctors. That's what it seemed like she was leading into, not like oh okay, these people get more funding than us. Or if she is saying that point, then you know. I think she was. Saying, you know, I think she was well, saying. Well, no, I, maybe I think it was more like. A, a MD makes yeah, more money than a scientist, dope. right? Like, you know what I'm saying? A researcher isn't getting paid like a, a, a practitioner is. Right, but you can't call any of them poor. You know what I'm saying? Think about it in terms yeah. of us, right? Let's take the whole thing. Agreed, agreed. We're lawyers, agreed. We're lawyers, we're lawyers, right? There's definitely a scheme, I mean, like a pay scheme for lawyers. Whether you're a brand new baby lawyer, associate, if you're a senior lawyer, if you're a partner, if you're, I mean, if you're an associate, if you're a, uh, um, a senior associate, if you're a partner, if you're a senior partner, or are you just some public servant working as like a public defender, or are you your own lawyer? Do you have your own law firm? People just expect lawyers to have money, period. They don't think about, just like doctors, they don't think about how much money we have in them student loans and what our bills look like or any of that. They just think, all right, this is what they bill. They got money. Doctors are the same Correct. way. Like, so yeah. So yeah, when you're looking at attorneys, I mean, when you're looking at a doctor, generally speaking, they have, they 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 not broke, you know, and and I think she's talking about both aspects. I think she's saying, all right, when you're talking about and when you're looking at the hierarchy of it, medical doctors, scientists, um, MDs, I mean, uh, general practitioners, they they make peanuts in comparison to big pharma, but at the same time, like and and also too, the amount of money that they probably get to to try to resolve a problem. Is probably not as much money as they would give to Big Pharma in order to handle it. However, it's still more money than the average person. You know what I'm saying? And I think that that right there is where where there's a disconnect. But you can't you can't use the word poor when you're talking about somebody that makes an average of six figures. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, it's the way I mean, explaining it. I think you could have did a better job with that. Uh, but I understand she was lagging, but she's trying to make everybody sympathetic. Like, oh, we don't get paid that much, so we're not incentivized to do anything. 
I don't know. That's not really gonna go. It's not going over with me. I'm like, eh, yeah, I, I yeah, that, that part. Yeah, right. You know, the system. Yeah, you see what I'm saying? If you ain't, that's what you she's ain't. trying to say. Uh, I can yeah. understand she was like coming from the standpoint like, man, it's the same thing for like a prosecutor. You can't be like, oh, well, I'm, I'm doing my job, I'm and, you know, but I ain't part of the system. No, like you get you get grouped into it. You part of the system. Like, yeah, yes, you are. <laughs> exactly. Like, okay, I work in indigent criminal defense, right? Even though I work for a private practice, I'm still working in the system because every single day I have to meet with my indigent clients who don't have the money, they can't really afford a lawyer, and I'm asking them to trust me to help them out of the situation that they're in. And a lot of them don't trust me because they think I'm a part of the system. Am I to an extent? Yes. But the part of the system that I am a part of is not the part that they think I'm a part of, right? Because it's multifaceted. Right. So it's the same thing in the medical field. Like, yeah, y'all are part of this conglomerate. And when people look at doctors, that's where these conspiracy theories come from. When you talk about big pharma paying doctors to push pills, because not for nothing. I don't know if either of you have ever had the experience, but I've definitely had the experience where I've gone to the doctor for something and they telling me, oh, take these samples. You know, because you're trying to get me to take this medication and I don't need it. You're not even telling me why you want me to take it or you're telling me and it's some half-assed answer. You see what I'm saying? Like, you haven't really officially diagnosed me with anything. You just want me to take something to fix some symptom that might go to a bigger problem just so you can keep me coming back. I'm not doing that. You see what I'm saying? And there's a lot of other people that ain't doing that too. And so when you when you talk about that and you start looking at the money and how it's distributed and trickled down and all that, I mean, the problem is, aside from just the colonial aspects of it, I mean, not the colonial, the capitalistic aspects of it, it's politicized. Right. And people lack an understanding of how these systems work. You see what I'm saying? And so without that proper education and really understanding how these systems work. Yeah. It's easy to be like, all right, well, ladies talking about they poor. So now you're saying that to a bunch of people who don't average making six figures and all they hear is, oh, let me find out these scientists don't make money like me. Well, no, they still make money. They still are getting money. It might not be a lot. They might have higher, a higher level of bills because of the education that they have and, and they have to pay towards that. But that, and so in the grand scheme, like when you're comparing the two based on lifestyle, it may look as though they're poor. But when you're looking at dollars, that's a different situation. Agreed. Um, I just think uh, she could have just explained that thing better. No way you're gonna convince people like us or anybody, especially her audience, that you know she's she's poor. So um, I got the next video queued up here. Um, I'm gonna share my screen here. Um, all right, there we go. Uh, we're still here, so we can still keep going. Um, so vaccines in general, I. Okay, are we still here? Can someone tell me if you can still hear me? <laughs> it's a system that was created primarily for white people and not just white people, for capitalists, right? For rich people. So that's the context that we're like living in. And I think that's really important to understand because the founding of America, I mean, it's a settler colonial state. And that means any system that exists within the framework of uh, yeah they must be paying me billions um that's why i'm sitting on my couch like on my sad tv um so uh basically the context that it's created in is it's, it's a system created by white supremacists by capitalists so it's meant to be hierarchical and exploitative, right that's every system that we're talking about so that's k-12 education that's medicine that's healthcare. that's um uh, obviously police and prisons any any social system that we're talking about is colonial. So when we're talking about medicine and science, it's colonial. But when we're talking about decolonizing, what that means is thinking about it from the perspective of what is important to our communities. And it's extremely problematic to center America when we're talking about vaccines because a lot of vaccines have been developed outside of this realm. So a lot of major, major innovations, scientific innovations, have come out of other countries by black and brown scientists. And the fact that people don't 
talk about that is in itself, I think, a little jarring because America is just like the center of the universe. Like that's how, when I came into America, that's how I saw the conversation around vaccines and healthcare in general. Um, that there was a complete lack of even an awareness of like who made this particular vaccine, right? And I have like, I guess the mark of like what people call the mark of the third world, and I hate that word, but um, essentially we in our part of the world value vaccines because we do get taught how to use it. Okay, um, I should be working on So yeah, uh, so there's a lot of people of color behind this. And I think it's important to talk about who comes so number one, the Pfizer vaccine, which is the Pfizer, um, the most recent. So yes, you said a lot of what I just got finished saying about it being a, a hierarchical type society. But one thing she did say that I didn't say was the fact that it was created by white supremacists, right, to benefit rich white folks. Um, but one thing I wish she had mentioned was what are these what are these countries that she's talking about, societies that she's talking about, where these vaccines um, were de developed that were outside of colonialized societies? Um, yeah, like I, she doesn't really she doesn't really talk about which which countries or give any examples of which countries or places that she's referring to. I wish she had touched on that a little bit more. And wait, wait. Uh, I think some of that is wait, actually the, more into the show. The Hold on for a second. Wait, what did you say, Malik? Yeah, I was asking you um, about, uh, you mentioned um, you wish you would have touched on about the countries. Uh, can you repeat that last part? Yeah, like give us, some, give us some examples about what societies that she's referring to that were de that are developed i mean that are outside of colonial societies like what country has not been colonized where they develop vaccines because i just i don't know oh. the answer to that question okay got it go ahead because Sorry as far that. as i know and i could totally be wrong and i'm perfectly fine with being wrong as far oh, no, as no. i know damn near every, okay damn near every country i know has been colonized like what part of the yeah, world not, has not been colonized? Um, but a lot of every country hasn't been colonized, right? But what she's saying is, it, there's a essentially what she's saying. What I got from it, what everybody else says that really, since she's woke, everybody who's woke is saying white supremacy is a global system, and it's right. globally dominated. Even if you haven't been, I don't know, officially colonized. You're still colonized now mm -hmm. because you're living up this global system of white supremacy. Because at any moment, right. white supremacy can trick you either through you know war or through other means. So even if they can't bully you through war, they can bully you through other means. And I think that's what she's kind of getting at with that. And they they do a lot of psychological uh supremacy by not promoting the fact that black and brown people have developed a lot of vaccines and a lot of uh medical advances they don't sit promote that um and that evidence is clear oh, because oh, people oh, just and, and, and that's, that's what i'm trying to jump into yeah like from where though right, because yeah. pretty much all right all right that's, that's what i was about to get into too sam that that hold on hold on hold on that's what I was about to get into. She kind of talks about that later on in that in that clip. Literally, I just couldn't keep recording it all and cutting it. So mm -hmm. I would urge anybody who who's interested in the subject to please watch the whole thing because if you do, you know what I'm saying, you will get to kind of get some of those different those answers because she goes into like different vaccines that might have been created in other countries that were brought into the U.S. Right? You know what I'm saying? So um, she gives some examples I, off the top of my head. I can't remember them, but um, but that's some of the stuff that's kind of in that's it is a little bit included in there, but for purposes of okay. like recording it and trying to break down snob by so that we didn't necessarily have so much, you know what I'm saying, in regards to wanting to just like chop it up so it could be more palatable. Um, it, it took a little bit more time for so so I had to cut some things a little bit short <laughs> um that was going into it. And so that's what I was gonna say to hit what Malik was saying. She touched on that, 
um, and, and uh, what both you guys were just referring to. She touched on that, and it, it, and like I said, if people check out her page and check out that video, you got the time. You know, it is it is pretty. Uh, it's worth at least a listen, um, as it can bring about a different perspective on things um, from a person who's in the field, also with an understanding of history within medicine and within the black and brown communities. So. Um, I did want to add that. I also okay. thought that, you know, she was absolutely spot on in regards to, you know, colonialism and how that those systems have played into society. Um, so with that, like, you know, I, I definitely can agree with that um, from I know those are topics for different conversations within how it has played out in each one of those. And that's why I don't want to get in go in depth with that. Um, but I totally can agree with that statement. And I'm sorry, Monique, I know I cut you off. So you had something you were trying to say. Oh, um, you know, just basically I was um, wrapping up with uh, what she was saying. I totally agree with her. You know, um, white supremacy is in all areas of activity. She said from K through 12, everything. So mm -hmm. there's no argument here. I mean, there's not a real no, debate about it. I mean, I even touched on the hierarchy in law, right? I mean, and that's just at a law firm. That's not even talking about what happens just in the justice system altogether, right? Because you have you have your um, your politicians who you know sit in one space. Then you have judges. Then you have you know, attorneys, then you have paralegals and legal assistants. Like, it's always a hierarchy. There's always some sort yeah. of a hierarchy. Um, yeah. Was there any more um, video? Oh, go ahead, I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, I do have one more video here. Uh, I think that was it. Um, no, I have one more. I'm going to queue it up right now. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I just, uh, it is interesting. I never thought about, I mean, I have noticed that there's a hierarchy in almost everything, but I have not I never thought about it in terms of colonialization. I think that that's a very interesting observation. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we'll talk about it in a minute. Mm-hmm. In fact, when it comes to vaccines, previous um, vaccines, um, and this is again, we're talking about um, international international scientists, right? Like this happens at an international scale. Communities in uh, black and brown communities in the African subcontinent, in South Asia, in Southeast Asia have been victimized and been subject to unethical um, vaccines essentially during the clinical trial process, right? And again, that's not surprising. This is like the history of this country. Um, that's how majority of medicine has been created. So when we talk about decolonization, like what is that? So Southeast Asia is one of the places, one of the regions that she was referring to. That what um, that 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 the colon it was as a colonial society. And they've been used as guinea pigs too. I mean, I just the guinea pig business is a, is a funny business. You know what I mean? It's a funny business. It's because it's just just let people choose to do what it is that they if they want to help volunteer all that stuff. That's cool, but don't target people based on a particular nationality or whatever. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, I get why you might need. And I don't even necessarily of, think so much. More black people, more right. Asian people, because you know the way our body is, uh, the way that our bodies are set up, you know, we're gonna respond differently. But you, you might want to market it, but don't just use this as crash test dummies. You know what I'm saying? You, you know what I mean? And, yeah, I but see, that's what I was gonna get at. I think it's not necessarily so much that it's like, oh, don't use us. Like I feel like they look at that because it's like, you know. I'm not comparing it to this, but it's like the thought process is, okay, I could throw these bodies there, right? You know what I'm saying? I could use these bodies because maybe for the powers that be, they don't, you know what I'm saying, feel like they care, right? Like it's almost like this is a dehumanization, right? So let's let's test it out on them, you know what I'm saying? And let's see. And and people if you offer if you offer maybe somebody five thousand dollars to take the vaccine, 
an average person is going to do it. You know what I'm saying? That's 5K. You feel me? So, like, people are in such situations, such dire situations that, you know what I'm saying, if you could just offer a little bit of something, you know what I'm saying, a person's going to be like, you know what, I'll take that opportunity, not necessarily taking into consideration that, man, this is getting targeted to individuals who may not have the funds, may not have access to healthcare, may not have access to other type of things that could help them to not necessarily be in a position to feel like I have to put myself in a vulnerable situation in order for, you know what I'm saying, me to make a couple dollars or I have to subject myself to certain type of testing and things in order to, you know, under the gauze of uh, advancing medicine, right? But in reality, it's, you know what I'm saying, me putting myself out there and my life on the line so that, like you said, you know, maybe we can see if they have a cure. Maybe we can find out how it affects on certain type of people. Maybe we can find out how it affects individuals with different types of conditions. Who knows, right? And um, that's what I think is like the issue because it's like, why do we have, and again, this is a topic for another day, but why do we have it so that it's, it's so that all of the individuals who are in positions to necessarily um, to take these tests and be a, be these test dummies are ones that are in such private situations. Um, and I think that's right. the biggest that, thing. I think that's that, something that, I want viewers to think about, you know, to kind of reflect on uh, on this show and, and be mindful of, I'm sorry, and just be mindful when they're looking to take the vaccine themselves. And, I, and that's all I really wanted to say. Right. And wrapping up, you know, right. my thoughts that, on this topic and, you know, how I look to address it. Right, and that's pretty much what I'm saying. Like, it's one thing if people make a, a a choice to go ahead and participate, but it's something totally different when people are being targeted, just like the Tuskegee experiment, right? Like, yeah, you wanted to test them. You wanted to give them syphilis just to see how they, they were going to respond, what was going to happen. Like, that, that's not it. Like, you told them it was one thing and it was actually another. Whereas if you told them it was a flu shot and it was legitimately a flu shot, that's different because you're giving people uh, um, an open and informed ability to make a decision. You know what I'm saying? And, and when you take that, when you take that away from them, mm -hmm. you know what I'm saying? It's, it's, it's just it's, it's a lie and it's not right on top of the fact that it's targeted towards a certain type of people like give people the opportunity just like you know i think that black people specifically right don't trust the metal like i saw a meme the other day that resonated with me because it was like stop telling black people that they don't trust um i think it said something to the effect and i'm probably butchering it but don't don't tell black stop telling black people excuse me that they don't trust um the medical system because um, why did it say because of, I don't know, um, oh, I, stop trying to say that black people don't trust the medical system because they just don't understand when in actuality there's a whole history as to why black people don't trust the medical system. You know what I'm saying? It's like if you stop creating this environment for people to distrust you, then you're not going to have the problem when you need them to trust you. It's like it's just, it's it's simple logic. Stop lying to the folks, and the folks are gonna believe you. You know what I'm saying? They're more inclined to be like, "All right, cool, I'm I'm, I'm with it," as opposed to being like, mm, "I don't know." Like I, I had a conversation with people, and the question came up like, "Who's taking the vaccine?" Everybody in the conversation was like, "Radio silent." Like I ain't taking that thing, and but I know people, but I also know people that have taken it. You know, because like you said before, E, they their 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 lifestyle kind of requires it, right? Because they're afraid of of getting hurt and or sick. Um, I don't know. That's just what I think. Do you guys have anything you want to add? Uh, not really. Um, I basically agree with everything she was trying to say in terms of um, uh, the colonialists and white supremacy. Um, running things and controlling things. So, I mean, I think she hit the nail on the head with that one. Oh, y'all got, got anything else? I think we pretty much, yeah, got on uh, this one. Podcast and everything. And I'm gonna close us out with our theme music here. 
Yeah, thanks for joining us, guys. Yeah, thanks for coming out. Yeah, yeah, this is a wrap. I definitely appreciate everybody for coming together. You know what I'm saying? Giving us a listen, you know, and just getting everybody's thoughts and opinions on this topic. You know what I'm saying? Like, neither one of us um, are claiming to be experts on this topic. We just wanted to push the conversation a little bit further and provide some intake from someone who is an expert in the field and, and some of their thought process on some of the things that, and the way that we look to address this situation from our, our community, which is one of our number one focuses in which we do this podcast in mind. So, so yeah, <laughs> I think that was pretty, like, you know, pretty good, man. What y'all got going on this rest of the day? Everybody good? My family's here. I'm good. I'm just chilling. Yeah, I'm just chilling. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. I feel it. Hey, I feel it, man. Hey, well, you know, as always, you know, peace and love. Definitely appreciate everybody for checking out. One time, we're going to go ahead, get ready to close out one time. You feel me? Peace out, peace, love, and soul grease, what they say. Happy you know what I'm saying? New Year. More blessings in this new year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. let's get it one time.